Hi guys, welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Tonight's session is planetary versus deep sky imaging. And I don't mean one is better than the other, I just mean, well, we always uh, tell people, oh, your, your setup might be better for planetary rather than deep sky. Or sometimes we say, oh, you can't really do imaging with that type of setup. And uh, sometimes we, w without saying it mean, you can't do deep sky imaging so well with that setup. It's not optimized for deep sky. But a lot of times, um, planetary, uh, those, those setups that we say you can't really do with uh, deep sky, uh, planetary actually might work really well. Uh, so I'm going to do a little bit about, about uh, this, and I'm no expert in this, but uh, as always, of course, uh, I do want to show off our image of the week, and before I flip this over, oh, and before you see my Google feed, because I can't believe that just popped up there. Wow, a nude, nude bike race. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, there you go. Uh, this week's image of the week is uh, Nicholas Kazilian's Pelican and North American Nebula. Uh, very cool field there. We all know that field. That is such a beautiful field. Um, it has that uh, beautiful air region around the North American Nebula, kind of the Gulf region, with the dust spilling into... Uh, what is that, Texas, I guess you'd say? And then also the, the head of the pelican with the Herbig Hyrule object. Maybe next week Nicholas will be on to uh, chat about this. I know he's been on in the past. Nicholas, you're welcome to come by. I don't think we had last week's winner um, give us any additional info on his wide field shot, but uh, it was a pretty cool one as well. And remember, guys, you can always submit these things, whether it be on Facebook, on Google+, or just emailing it over to me. Uh, if it's on Google+, just share the image with the Astro Imaging channel, and you'll be in consideration. Facebook, uh, well, I don't know how to work Facebook, but uh, either way. Um, okay, so let me pull this back because I'm going to have to go to a full screen share. Okay. <laughs> Where am I going? Right there. Okay, stop me if you cannot see my screen or if you're not seeing the right slides. Um, planetary versus deep sky imaging. What can you do with what you have? And uh, I'm reiterating that. Um, basically, you may come in and we'll poo-poo your equipment and say, no, you can't really do it, but uh, we might just be kind of deep sky centric where we're saying well it might not do deep sky so well your mount may not track so well you might have a little bit too much focal length or you might have too much weight for your mount to handle whatever the reasoning um, if we do say those things maybe maybe there is a t different type of imaging for you and uh, it might be planetary so deep sky imaging targets tend to be things like nebulae um, obviously uh, it's, it's a deep sky object. It's really far away. It's dim. Uh, things like galaxies, again, very far away, dim, maybe not so small, apparent, not, ha not having such small apparent size, uh, whereas planets might be kind of small, but they're also bright. Um, other deep sky targets, uh, another wide field target, uh, uh, dark nebula, so just dim, dim, dim dust in front of H-alpha. Um, all these images, the last three that I've shown you, were anywhere between uh, 9 and, I don't know, 20 hours. Maybe, maybe this is 25 hours worth of exposure time. But there's another option, planetary imaging. And uh, if you look at the moon pick on the left, well, the exposure there was uh, about, uh, I don't know, maybe 1 200th of a second. Um, if you look at the right there, these are some of Jerry Rodriguez's uh, planetary shots, and um, those are probably videos that were no longer than two minutes or so. Uh, and he, Jerry has a book on this, but you can also jump in the planetary forum on Cloudy Nights and just be blown away by the images that you're going to see. And Jerry did a great job on these, but I, I don't know. I flip through and I see some of the Mars images that are coming out right now, and it's unbelievable the detail you can see. Uh, there are guys who are as good at planetary as there are guys who are good, good at DSO. It's just whatever you choose to do. And uh, again, we're DSO-centric here, but that doesn't mean you can't take some great planetary images. 
Um, another type of, well, it's kind of planetary, or at least it uses the same type of gear, would be solar imaging uh, in white light. You can use a white light filter uh, with the same equipment that you would use for planetary imaging and get sunspots. Um, or if you have a uh, um, H-alpha scope, you could do H-alpha, but that requires kind of additional expensive gear, and I'm kind of focusing this on what you could do with what you have, and I don't think you have a, a, an H-alpha solar telescope lying around there if you're watching this, um, unless you do, and you, but at that point you probably already know what you're doing. Um, so there are similarities between them. Uh, what, what are those similarities? Well, both require telescopes and mounts. Well, duh. Uh, both require cameras. Yeah, of course. Um, both involve some processing. Rarely are we taking one shot and then sending it out there. Well, that moonshot I took uh, was basically slightly processed, but a lot of the planetary stuff requires some processing. Uh, you may be throwing out some of the individual subjects. Uh, remember, with planetary, they're video, but you may be throwing out some subs or some individual stills in that video. Um, whereas with Deep Sky, uh, well, we're all about processing. We talk for an hour each, uh, every Sunday about processing basically. So you know there's a lot involved in that. Uh, but both allow for improving skills. Um, the first planetary images, just like the first DSO images you take, are not going to be so good. Or, well, you may be jumping up and down happy with them, but um, in a few weeks you're going to be a lot better. In a few months you're going to be a lot better. And a few years later you're really going to be hitting home runs. Um, both involve enjoying astronomy, and if you're here, you probably enjoy astronomy. Well, I hope you enjoy astronomy. If you're not, if you're not having fun, you're not doing it right. Maybe you shouldn't be doing it. Um, but I don't know. There's something to be said for uh, going out, uh, whether it's with your gear, or without your gear, but outside at night, looking up at the stars, looking up at the planets, and taking an appreciation of what you're seeing. And uh, last but not least, we'll both will give you images that will awe your friends. Uh, your friends will be amazed at what you're doing. Uh, they know it's a geeky hobby, but they're also they also think it's a pretty darn cool and geeky hobby. Um, so uh, there are differences. Uh, the difference there should be that should say the differences. Um, but with planetary imaging, uh, it does require a tracking mount, and I'm gonna I'm gonna say uh, I'll give you a qualifier in there. You may be able to do some planetary without a tracking mount, um, but it's going to make life a lot easier. Deep sky imaging requires uh, a good mount and probably a good equatorial mount. Now, the, just like I said, oh, you may not need tracking for planetary. Well, you really do need tracking for deep sky imaging, and you really should have an equatorial mount. Um, I started out with an alt, alt as mount for deep sky and you really don't get far. Um, if you have an alt azimuth mount, planetary imaging may be your best the, the best way to start. At least get a camera hooked up there and figure out if you uh, really like what you're doing. With planetary imaging, aperture is really important. Long focal length is what you want. With deep sky imaging, a fast f ratio is more important than aperture. We can settle for wide fields because there are large, expansive targets out there, whereas planets tend to be very small. Uh, so we settle for uh, small telescopes, and short focal length is almost our friend sometimes because you can capture a lot of the object. With planetary imaging, recording video really is best. You can use a specialized webcam for planetary imaging, uh, more of an astronomy-centric webcam, uh, and you'll get great shots with it. Um, some of them are mono with filters, just like we have for Deep Sky, but uh, you can also use just an RGB webcam. When you get serious about it, mono with filters helps because it helps you improve your frame rate, might help you with some resolution, um, and you can combine it all after the fact. Um, but you can use a webcam. Uh, honestly, you can modify the webcam that you're probably uh, that you probably have hooked up to your computer, but planetary webcams um, under some of the big brands are relatively inexpensive. They are cheaper than most DSLRs. In fact, you can get them a lot cheaper than DSLRs. 
I think uh, my webcam is about $285, and I got what I think is kind of a good one. Um, but uh, I think Celestron and Orion and a few of these companies do sell them if you just wanted to wet your feet with it. Um, with deep sky imaging, taking individual long exposures is really best right now. Uh, we, were, we were chatting right before the session about CMOS and how that might be changing things, and maybe we'll talk about that after the presentation, but right now, cool CCDs uh, or DSLRs are the primary way we're taking deep sky photo uh, photographs, uh, or images I should say. Um, we take lots of subs. Whereas with planetary imaging, acquisition can take one minute. Actually, acquisition could take 10 seconds or 15 seconds. But sometimes you try and take a minute and then dump 90% of the worst frames. You're actually taking really, really fast exposures, turning it into a video. And those video, uh, you can dump the bad exposures, and we call this lucky imaging. With Deep Sky, acquisition tends to take hours uh, or longer. Um, some people put uh, some people put two three hours in. Some people put forty hours in. It's uh, however however you want whatever you want to get out of it. But uh, with deep sky, the amount of overall time really determines the quality. Whereas with planetary, uh, once you have enough aperture, um, basically it's your seeing that limits you. Uh, a good deep sky imaging setup. So we talk about this often. We say the the Orion Sirius mount. It's an equatorial mount. An 80 millimeter refractor and an APO is probably best so you don't get blue fringes or, or chromatic aberration um, or even uh, any sort of aberrations in the corners. Uh, they have flat field um, refractors that have pinpoint stars to the corners. There's a lot of stuff to think about when you're buying a refractor for deep sky imaging. You can use a DSLR and I always suggest starting out with a DSLR but you do need a guide camera. You may not need to start with one, but eventually you're going to be guiding, uh, which means probably putting a guide scope on there or an OAG, an off-axis guider, which uh, is what I'm using. And I think when you go to longer focal length setups, you're probably more... Uh, an OAG becomes a bigger benefit. With a guide scope, you get some flexure. Um, long focal lengths or any sort of mirrored telescopes with a guide scope can, can cause troubles. And you also need a laptop. Um, well, you don't need a laptop, but you really should have a laptop. I'm, I repeat that all the time. Uh, and a good planetary setup. Well, this this one uh, setup, the Celestron ADX and SCT package, the package that we poo-poo all the time for deep sky imaging. Not that it's not a workable setup, but it's really hard to get working, and it's probably not a beginner setup. You probably want a better mount than the ADX to use an 8-inch SCT on. But it makes a great planetary setup. Um, albeit, it's a pricey setup if you're just starting out, but really can take great planets. A go-to DAB can kind of do the same thing if you can get the camera close enough. There might be some issues with uh, getting it in focus, but uh, that's something to go on and ask about the forums. But the point is, DABs are basic, basically, even on equatorial platforms, are no-nos for S uh, D DSOs. Uh, planetary, you can kind of get away with it and do a pretty good job. Uh, Alt azimuth mounts, uh, like the Celestron CPC, uh, that's what I started out with. Really good at planetary. Deep sky, not so great. Get a wedge, but it's still limited by the quality of the mount. Um, and of course, the planetary camera, I went into a little bit about it, but webcams work great. You can Google planetary cameras yourself and I would actually Google cloudy night planetary cameras and then see what people are shooting with what cameras and you will see uh, some pretty great images with some relatively inexpensive cameras. And a laptop. Well with planetary you need a laptop. With DSO you really really should have a laptop. With planetary you need a laptop. Um, Acquisition software. So basically, this is the software you're going to be using, but it kind of determines the routine. Of course, you set up your telescope with deep sky, you polar align with planetary. You polar align kind of good if you have a uh, pol polar mount. If you have an alt as mount, you don't worry about that. Uh, you probably just tell it where a few stars are, and then you're off and running. Deep sky, I mean, you do polar align, and then probably drift align as well. But 
we're talking about the software right now because it's basically what it is. Planetary imaging you use software like Fire Capture for recording video. Uh, it's very basic. It really just imports what's on the webcam. Sometimes it has some additional features like nudge. You can nudge your telescope left or right. Sometimes it gives you focus metrics because it can be hard to tell when you're in perfect focus on a planet. Um, so it'll tell you how sharp the image it, it thinks the image is, and uh, you can get a little bit. Uh, you can turn your focus knob a little bit, and it'll say, "Well, it's sharper." Oh nope, it's not as sharp. So it gives you some metrics to work with that. For deep sky imaging, there are a few different pieces of software like Backyard EOS. Sky X Sequence Generator Pro, just depending on what routine you want. But all of these software packages kind of do the same thing. Um, they give you mount control or, or some mount control. Uh, in, in the case of Backyard EOS, it's more DSLR centric, so the mount control is basically just plate solid. Um, whereas something like the Sky has a lot more mount control, and even Sequence Generator Pro is for full automation. Uh, the Sky can do full automation with some additional stuff. Um, the Sky and Sequence Generator Pro do autofocus. I think the Sky needs some additional uh, software to do that as well. But uh, basically, with Deep Sky Imaging, since we're taking these runs over such a long period of time, a lot of us like to get sleep while we're doing it. And the software has to do most of the acquisition for us. Whereas with Planetary, you're basically, you can be out there for 10 minutes, get enough data to be happy with it, and uh, then come in and work on processing. So the processing software differences, uh, it, we do a lot of the same stuff. Uh, there's some stuff that may be involved in pre-processing planetary images. Uh, I know there's a software package called PIP, which I think rates and um, possibly, uh, uh, what I, I think it, not that it aligns, I think it kind of de-shakes the video, so it improves your ability to read it, but uh, you can do some of that in AviStack or Registax or AutoStackers, uh, and these are basically the stacking programs. Um, I, if you don't know what stacking is, basically um, whether it be with deep sky imaging or planetary imaging, you are taking the individual subs and averaging them. And by averaging them, you can either work noise out of them, or in some cases you can get, you just want a higher signal to noise ratio so maybe you can do more of it in post-processing. So you can have a better image to go into post-processing. Um, so the stacking programs, AviStack, Registax, and AutoStacker basically do the same things for the planetary guys that Deep Sky Stacker, PixInsight, PixInsight D CCD Stack do for us Deep Sky guys, but they are different programs, and occasionally someone will pop into Cloudy Nights saying, um, I am trying to uh, stack my uh, deep sky images with Registax, and we have to say, nope, don't use Registax, or sometimes someone will say, I'm trying to process my planetary image with Deep Sky Stacker, and we'll say, nope, don't do it with Deep Sky Stacker, download Registax or AutoStacker. Um, and uh, then uh, we all do some post-processing. In fact, Registax has wavelets in post-processing, which helps you to sharpen a planet, and it's pretty powerful. Uh, the PixInsight people here know about wavelets, and that's one of the benefits of using PixInsight as post-processing. But um, we, it is helpful to kind of separate the two, because you can also do your post-processing in Photoshop. Um, with Deep Sky, uh, PixInsight actually does both pre-processing and post-processing, but PixInsight um, has a routine for the pre-processing and stacking, um, and then you can do it manually, but um, the routine for, for a lot of beginners I think is a lot more basic. It, it kind of automates everything, um, but it also generates your calibration frames and calibrated frames, so you can take them in and pre -pro and um, stack them manually if you'd like. And then in post, you can use PixInsight, Photoshop, Star Tools. There's lots of options. Um, there's if, if you're not happy to just do planetary imaging, there's a lot of really cool stuff you could do, uh, and I'll call it advanced planetary imaging. Uh, there's a program called WinJupos, which does rotation and derotation. 
So with the rotation, you can actually um, take, basically what you do is you kind of take a skin of Jupiter, say, and you put it, and Wind Jupos puts it around a sphere and rotates it so you see it as if Jupiter's rotating. For derotation, you take that same skin and it kind of opens it up as if you're looking at the whole planet on a flat map. And um, the other, one of the other cool things with uh, that uh, rotation is you can see the moons of, say, Jupiter or Saturn uh, orbiting the planet. And you actually see them pass in front of the disk and then move to the side. And there's some really cool stuff. If you get into solar, you can do some animation. So say you take a solar image every five minutes or you take a solar video and process it to get an image every five minutes. Then you combine them and you flip through them as if it was a flip book and you get pretty cool animations of sunspots. Um, you can do lots of cool stuff with it. There's, it's basically unlimited. And wow, that's all I've got. Uh, I, I haven't even looked at the time, but I think that was a quick presentation. Yes, that was a quick presentation. But uh, I did want to keep it short because this is for all those people that uh, come on and we say, what did I change? Come on, uh, that come on here and we say, oh, no, you can't really do it. But uh, truth is you can do it. Um, oh, yeah, and Eric's, Eric wants me to mention that Registax is free. So is AutoStacker. A lot of free software out there. Deep Sky Stacker is free. Photoshop is not free, but if you're doing planetary, GIMP uh, uh, is a free program that will get you pretty far. The Deep Sky guys don't like GIMP so much because it limits us to uh, six, uh, to 8-bit files. Is it 8-bit files or is it 16-bit files? I think it's 8-bit files that it limits us to. Uh, but um, either way, uh, you can do a lot of stuff in GIMP, and I did, a, I did some DSO stuff in GIMP uh, with some limitations. But I did want to mention, um, we were having a conversation earlier, and I'm going to try and, I'm hoping to open this up to the room since I went so quick. Um, CMOS cameras are basically what have become the primary planetary camera. CMOS can read off the chip really fast. And they at this at the moment have a little bit more noise per pixel size they tend to have smaller pixels but and less noise but the way it scales they, they're a little bit noisier and the noise may not be as random as CCDs but um, CMOS really are the future whether it be for planetary or DSOs we know in we, we assume in five ten years we're all going to be moving to CMOS cameras uh, it's, it's a better design, but it's just not as mature as CCDs uh, when it comes to deep sky. Uh, CCDs are designed to have low noise. They, we let ourselves have larger pixels um, because we, well, larger pixels can gather more light and kind of uh, give us a little bit more dynamic range because it's older technology, so we're just kind of taking what we have, and it, it does work well. But um, what we were what we were chatting about is some of these planetary cameras uh, may actually be good for some deep sky targets, and some people are actually using them right uh, right now to do stuff. And the, the chat we were having was about planetary nebula because there are some really bright cores of planetary nebula. For example, the uh, Cat's Eye Nebula, um, really bright core. And you can get it with a planetary camera. In fact, if you're using a, a DSLR or a CCD, it isn't necessarily perfect for it. You, you can do it, but it might benefit you to have much smaller pixels and use that lucky imaging technique that I was talking about earlier. And uh, lucky imaging is basically taking a really fast frame rate video, so those frames only take a split second, and you pause the seeing, and you toss out most of the, the exposures that have been corrupted by bad seeing and keep the ones that happen to have good seeing. Um, so guys in the room, there aren't many of us tonight, but uh, what are your thoughts uh, basically on whether it be on CMOS cameras or basically any of the converse, uh, any of the topic tonight? I know I know we have one solar imager in the room. I'll comment on the uh, CMOS cameras. I mean, I 
they're uh, clearly going in the right direction. And, um, you know, you talked some about the pixel, sc pixel size scale difference, and um, I think a lot of us who are using the Sony cams are also using small pixels now, too. And kind of the benefit, same benefit with those is the lower read noise and, and uh, lower dark current noise on them. Um, but CMOS, the, one of the huge advantages is, like you said, kind of they can be read out very quickly. So if you're taking short exposures, like doing lucky imaging or planetary imaging, you can get a lot more frames a lot more quickly. For example, my Sony uh, QSI camera, the download time is still pretty long. And, you know, I could do a, a region of interest, but it's still going to be like 10 seconds, 15 seconds for the full, full frame of it. And um, it makes, it makes uh, you know, that kind of short, imaging stuff take a lot longer than it needs to. So, like, I took a picture of the moon with my Sony camera, but it probably took 10 minutes to get a picture of the moon um, because I had to pause and download every frame in between to get that full resolution. But, um, you know, the uh, the company right now that's clearly doing really well is the ZWO is coming out with those ASI cameras, like the ASI 1600, 178, 174, 224. Um, they all look very cool. I think that maybe some of us with a, a little more, um, like Adam said, mature gear like the QSIs are hesitant to jump over some because the, the CMOS is still so early in its development. It has some issues with amp flow. It has some issues with uh, the bias frames being able to be consistent and constant. So, you know, that stuff generally isn't going to matter for planetary imaging because you're not taking longer exposures and developing an amp flow. You're not taking... Um, you know, longer exposures and getting getting lots of, uh, you know, your your full frame doesn't matter, I guess, is what I, what I should say, as much as it does in planetary. So um, I'm excited to see where it goes, and I don't think that we're that far off from getting something like a full frame CMOS camera that can download, you know, 20 or 30 frames per second and also be a full, full frame uh, high resolution camera. I mean, the, the day's coming where we get a full frame camera with three micron pixels and low read noise, and you know, I mean, that's where the game changer is going to be. And maybe two years away, maybe four years away, and I think a lot of us with QSIs and FLIs are anxiously awaiting either for ZWO to come out with a with a higher end model with an integrated filter wheel and and guide port, or for one of those other companies that targets the higher end market to come out with their own CMOS cameras. Um, sometimes their electronics tend to be a little bit better, and maybe the firmware and drivers are a little more stable. So, I mean, you know, I've definitely been on the edge of getting a 16200 or a 16803 for the last year, but uh, where I'm at right now is anxiously waiting to see where CMOS goes. I don't want to sink a ton of money into a full frame camera when my, my guess and hope is that there will be a full frame CMOS in the next couple of years that is going to be probably just as affordable but with much lower read noise and, high, and higher resolution, which is, you know, I would love to pair that with my Tech 140 and shoot it. 0.8 arc seconds a pixel and have a three by three degree field of view. So, so that's my thoughts on it right now. And I and I think that the days where you need separate setups for deep sky imaging and planetary imaging are going to kind of the, those two setups are going to start merging um, at some point. And I think that your mount is always going to be important no matter what. But but the mount may not have to track quite as well for quite as long um, in the next few years. Thanks, Josh. Yeah. And basically, for, for uh, a lot of us who just find this stuff interesting, what's really driving CMOS technology is camera phones. Um, they realize that people... You remember, I don't know, when was it? Eight years ago when your phone didn't have a camera on it? I mean, it changed the world. Uh, now, uh, I mean, not only, it literally changed the world. No matter where you are, camera phones... You see video, live videos of the Olympics. You see live videos of uh, political rallies. Uh, you see live videos from basically everywhere. You now have a camera on you all the time to take photos of your kids, record everything. Um, and because that has become so popular, these companies are just trying to get better cameras on their phones. And they said, hey, if we can make cameras this good, we can use them for other things. So now they're putting them on your car. And your car shakes your seat when you're driving, or your car wants to drive itself. There's, and basically, that ability to read off the chip so quickly and respond so quickly has been driving the CMOS market. Um, and CCDs can't do that. Um, CCDs 
if you want the low noise, the uh, the electrons kind of have to tiptoe off the side of the chip, whereas uh, CMOS, they can shoot themselves off the chip really fast. It's definitely an interesting time. Um, any other comments on this uh, or, or anything similar? Let me, I just want to jump into the Q&A and see if anything popped up. Aha! Um, so Grant's comment is uh, the his uh, particular lineup of software is Firecapture for acquisition, uh, AutoStacker two for stacking. I said AutoStacker. There's now version two, and uh, Registax for sharpening. And actually, yes, I do the same exact thing. Uh, I do Solar with the same uh, routine. Uh, Osiris is saying PIP is a great bit of software for planetary. Um, Grant is mentioning, uh, as for a Barlow, you should shoot for about F20 to F24. Uh, On his system, he found the Celestron two times Barlow to be best. Focusing is best starting with the Botanov mask, then upping the game on the planet's image on the camera to bring out the finest detail. Oop, jumped around a little bit. Uh, and I guess that... Uh, Walter is uh, asking, maybe that Grant's comment was a response to Walter's question. Uh, Walter came in a bit late, uh, not sure that I addressed this. Do you use a Barlow? If, if you do, what power? With as atmospheric turbulence, how do you handle focusing with the Barlow? Whenever I try, I have a horrible time with focus. Um, so when I've done planetary, I have used a bit Barlow, and I'm no expert on planetary. Uh, I do more solar and some lunar. Um, and I've only done planetary a few times, and I hope to have someone come on, but uh, this was more general to let people know that they can uh, do imaging with their setups, but it, even if we poo-poo them, I, I'm going to say that again, but uh, the, the, they should work with what they have and, and try and do what their setup does well. Um, so the bar that I have is a two times, um, and with atmospheric turbulence, how do you handle and focusing with the Barlow? It's hard. Um, I actually use, uh, I believe Fire Capture has a, what's it called? It, it says, I don't know if it says sharpness or something like that, but it gives you a sort of metric uh, with which to tell when you're in focus, even if you can't really tell with your eyes. Um, Oh, Osiris, were you last week's Image of the Week winner? Because uh, um, his comment is, last week's image was taken down from Albany, Western Australia, down the southwest coast of Australia. Seven image stack, just taken after sunset, taken with a 14 millimeter Sam Yang on a, 5D, a Canon 5D MK3. Uh, 30 second frames, ISO 5000, processed in Photoshop. Um, sounds like you are. Uh, congrats on that. Kevin's comment. Focusing. Um, so what I do, what I do, I have an ASI 120MC, which is the older model, not the USB 3. Still takes great images um, and great frame rate. So it's like the beginning of the the revolution of CMOS imagers, right? Um, I think that was one of the the first ones that really stood out. Um, but so what I do is slew to a nearby star and use a Batonov mask and take like a 30 second exposure. Um, Fire Capture's software does the real time focusing aid where it'll show you whether or not the, the focus is better or worse. Right. Uh, but it doesn't really show you whether or not you're in focus. It just says better or worse, right? So. Um, yeah. And the best image that I've had so far was using the batten off and a 30 second exposure and then tweaking it until the the pattern was as perfect as I could get it. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, I, I guess you could tell that I'm a solar imager. I don't have stars to use batten off masks on, which kind of stinks, but uh, I guess for planetary, yeah, you've got stars out there. So, uh, good tip. Um...
Kevin's saying he uses a Mead two times short Barlow, and as far as focus cons is concerned, if he can't tell if the planet's in focus, he packs up and goes inside visually. So I'm assuming that's a, a comment on seeing, which is probably uh, very important with planetary because uh, that is your limit. Um, us deep sky guys, we image over so many nights that we're not really, uh, I'm not going to say we're not concentrating on seeing, but uh, the good and the bad seeing nights average each other out, uh, and you don't have, or we're not doing lucky imaging. Um, so I guess a, a night of bad seeing is just an un unlucky imaging night. Um, and I'm sorry, my comments keep jumping around, but I think I got through all of them. Um, so yeah, uh, basically, uh, and if there's anyone out there that is considers themselves an experienced planetary imager, is proficient in either Registax, Autostacker, or whatever it may be, Windjupos, uh, you're welcome to come on, try and contact me off uh, on the site, uh, whether it be from the website, theastroimagingchannel.com, Google+, or even uh, reach out to us on Facebook. And uh, we'll have you on. We'll let you talk about planetary. Teach us how to take better planetary images. Um, but that's basically all I've got. So I uh, I don't see any further questions coming in. I don't think there's anything else um, to cover. And I don't see anyone in unless anyone inside the room has any further comments. Um, if so, speak now. If not, um, I will be trying to come up with something for next week. Uh, in a few weeks, I actually have something on ASA mounts, uh, Astro Systems Austria, uh, some really cool mounts. One of the first to actually offer unguided imaging, or I should say, um, I believe, absolute encoders for unguided imaging. Uh, or modeling, I should say, uh, and we'll we'll hear a little bit about that. Um, if you are, well, if you just want a really cool looking mount, or if you happen to be uh, overseas and you don't want to buy an AP or a um, software uh, a software bisque mount for that reason, uh, you've got something on your side of the pond. So, but quick session, uh, but uh, that's that's all I got. So I want to thank you all for coming. And uh, I will post midweek what next week's session is, and uh, I guess we'll see you then. Bye-bye now.